French, so I'm just going la 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 la.
It doesn't say to do a refrain there. song before, so you probably will remember it, I think. Um, but we will uh, instrumentally, Daniel and, uh, and we will play the whole song for an introduction, just because people might not know. We won't do that now, but we will do that.
Yeah, that seems a little quick. Valleys will have to be 
Good morning. My name is Fran Forsberg. I'm with the Affirming Committee, and I'm here to remind you and invite you to the Family Drag and Talent Show that is happening this Saturday coming up. There will be a silent auction. There's some beautiful artwork. There is Handyman, and he looks like, he really does look like, uh, what's his name? James Bond, he does. He's selling some services. So if you need work done in your house, um, so please come if you are able. It's here at the church again next Saturday. Doors open at 6.30, and the show starts at 7. I'm also here to remind you about Christmas dinner. If you would like to share it with us downstairs, Christmas Day, Ken is coming to play carols for half an hour. So you, we will have a sing-song, and we will have turkey. And if you'd like to sign up to drop anything off, if you can't attend, that would be appreciated as well. You'll have to bug Dorothy. I don't know where she put the sheet. What? Oh, yeah, the drag show, uh, the drag and family talent show, is that all the funds that we raise go to Sanctum 1.5, which is a home for homeless women that are pregnant, and they get all the services they need and get to keep their babies. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, these last couple weeks, we had a kind of poll at the back of the church about whether we should move forward with optional masking or continue with mandatory masking. Um, I thank you for everyone who has put in your opinion on this, and if you had any comments, the worship committee and the council discussed it at length, um, and we've decided that based on your responses, starting January 1st, 2023, masking will be strongly recommended, though no longer mandatory in the church for worship services. Excuse me. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts on this matter. If you have any questions about what will be happening going forward, feel free to talk to me after the service. Good morning, I'm Joanne Graham. Um, the Congregational Care Committee has been downstairs setting up the bake sale and oh my goodness, Santa's elves could take lessons in production from our Grosvenor bakers. Wow. There's everything down there from mincemeat tarts and classic Christmas cake to rhubarb strawberry jam. It, it just looks wonderful, and we're really excited to sell it to you. We'll see you right after. Good morning, my name is Lex Greer. Uh, I'm here to tell you about the Sicilian Singers Christmas concert, which is happening on December 11 here in this building. Uh, Grosvenor Park is a new home with the Sicilian Singers and we're, we're made to feel very welcome here. We have a wonderful program for you, lots of Christmas favorites, plus some wonderful harmony kind of music and some fun stuff too. So I would encourage you to come. Tickets are 25 bucks. You can get them on uh, Eventbrite, December 11, three o'clock. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. More council business. Uh, I'll be fast, I promise. Um, I'm Troy Schmill. I am the representative from MMP committee on council. I'm also uh, the former chair of co-chair of council. Um, we had to have, <clears throat> council had a meeting on this past Tuesday, on November 22nd, and I uh, just wanted to report on a few things and make a call out for some requests here. We are considering selling cookies and coffee at a fundraising, as a fundraising during the concert being held on December 4th. Anyone who's willing to volunteer, please see Anna Campbell. The annual congregational budget meeting is set for January 22nd, I believe after service. Um, follow the, this call out to reminder to all committees to please have your budgets in by December 1st. Grosvenor Park is hosting a disabilities conference scheduled to be scheduled and held to be held at the end of, towards the end of January 2023. We are tossing around the idea of having a lunch 
Um, this is a larger undertaking as the 10 is expected to be significant numbers. So if there's any volunteers that are interested in lending a hand, please see Brenda Baker. Council and our committees are looking for someone who is proficient and has the time to um, help us fill out a online application for a grant for our, that provides uh, funding for our summer students. It's a lengthy process, I won't lie. Um, that's why we're looking for someone. So if anyone's good at that kind of thing, anyone can, um, can lend a hand, that would be much appreciated. Um, it's, it's for a good, good result, but it is, as I said, a lengthy process and, and it's like online as well. So if anyone um, is willing to take that on, please see uh, Diane Phillips, Chair of Council. Thank you for your time. Good morning and welcome on this first Sunday of Advent. I'm Dorothy DeBruin, Grosvenor Park United Church's Congregational Leader for today. On behalf of myself, our congregation, and the Reverend Nabuko Iwe, welcome to you who jo join us live, in person, and across your large and small screens via YouTube. There are dots you can put on your name tags. The red dots mean that you are open to smiles and waves, but at a two meter distance. The green dots mean that you are open to handshakes and hugs with masks. The yellow dots mean that you want to be asked what you prefer in the moment. So before you get real close and personal with someone, please be aware of what color dot they are wearing and respect their choices. On the screen, you will occasionally see an asterisk, and that means that you can stand or sit as the spirit moves you, mostly around hymns, but occasionally other places too. And now the passing of the peace. We'll go to him. Salam, Santi. Creator calls us to live in peace, to spirit, LGBTQQIA+, and ally, seeking reconciliation as Treaty 6 people. As we gather on Treaty 6 land, also in the traditional homeland of the Métis, grateful for the longer nights, the air that freezes in our nose, the animals that hibernate and who survive the cold, Gratefully acknowledging the non-treaty Dakota First Nations and the Prairie Rond Métis. Knowing that our journey towards truth and reconciliation continues in the winter months of quiet and reflection. The peace of Christ be with you all. For Christ's coming, we simply wait. In this patient time of Advent, we simply wait. In the space made free for birthing justice and light, we simply In this waiting time of Advent, how can we prepare for hope? In the midst of busy to-do lists, our faith calls us to slow down, way down.
we make time to pray and reflect. We make space to part, to be part of the birthing of new things in all of creation. We light this candle to remind us to dive deeply into God's spirit as we create space and time to invite these things into our lives. Let us together worship God. prayer today is waiting can be hard work and the American sign language for waiting is <laughs> so you think about it when I'm waiting I'm going to count my fingers that's how you remember waiting can be hard work Whoa. work Whoa. so like you're banging a hammer or something no. so that's what we'll be using today as we do our prayer so we'll start with our refrain Waiting can be hard work. We wait 
as the daylight hours get shorter. Mm. Waiting mm. can be hard mm. work. <laughs> we wait mm. for justice and love to surround us. Waiting mm. can be hard work. Mm. When we tire of waiting, be with us, God of patience, God of action. Hear our prayers as in our time of waiting, mm -hmm. as prayer mm -hmm. is an action too. Mm -hmm. Waiting mm -hmm. can be hard work. Uh. Hear our prayers of thankfulness and mercy. We continue to pray in the knowledge of your love that surrounds us like the dark sky at night and the warm blankets on our beds. We pray knowing that we are forgiven people in the name of Jesus who comes to us as a vulnerable child in a world of hardship and of love. Amen. So, Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Oh, I'm stuck. Oh, well. In the church, this is the new year and the new season. We call it Advent. So I'm going to be asking you these questions through the four Sunday of, Sundays of Advent every week. So by the time we get to the fourth Sunday, you'll know the answers. Advent means... Coming, coming, pretty, pretty close. The color of Advent that we use in this church is blue. And the work of Advent is to wait, wait. It's a time of waiting, although some of us are not so good at waiting. We wait to celebrate once again the birth of Jesus. We wait for the coming of Christ's kingdom of peace and justice. We wait actively by doing some things every day. So um, some of you will have received an Advent calendar. It's available online, and there's a link to it in the leaflet as well. So it's an example of what you can do every day to do the waiting. Some of you, I, we ran out, so I made a few more copies, but I didn't, they're not in color, so they're not quite as pretty. Sorry about that. So uh, as we wait, we try to create space. Space for birthing love in our world. And this 
is one example of creating space. Now, does anyone know what this is? Green screen. And what does a green screen do? It takes your background out, and you can put an image on it, so it makes you look like you're somewhere else in the world. Um, movies use it all the time, sometimes pictures do. So the, the pictures up top are that green screen with an image on top of it. You can tell because you can see the little clothes pins that are stick, stuck on the edges that are part of that image. And, you know, it's, it's used in movies to create space that doesn't really exist. But it reminds us that it could exist. And it's space we didn't know we had. Now, there, there's a picture of a, a, an adult and a child, and the adult is kind of throwing the child up in the air. I'm not going to talk about that now, but I want you to remember that image for during the sermon, because I'm going to refer to that. So this year for Advent, we are talking about making space Space for all kinds of things. And today, we're talking about making space for hope and trust in the world. So we continue our Advent journey. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of God. And now our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city bound firmly together. tribes go up, the tribes of God, and give thanks to the name of God as was decreed for Israel. There the thrones of justice stand, the thrones of David's house. For the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. May there be peace within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my kin and friends, I say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of our God, I will see your good. reading today comes from Romans 13, verses 11 to 12. Besides, you know the time in which we are living. It is now the hour for you to wake from sleep, for our salvation is closer than when we first accepted the faith. The night is far spent, the day draws near. So let us cast off deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in daylight. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
Please be seated. And pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock, our redeemer, our source of hope and trust. Amen. So the first Sunday in Advent is traditionally called the Sunday of hope. And so we hear in the scripture words like this. The day is almost here. Put on your armor of light. Dr. Andy O'Neill argues that actually instead of hope, maybe it should be a Sunday of trust. That somehow hope is about something for which we long into the future. That trust is similar, but more present in the here and now. Matt Haig argues in Notes on a Nervous Planet that the societies we live in are increasingly making our minds ill, making it feel as though the way we live is engineered to make us unhappy. When Haig developed panic disorder, anxiety, and depression as an adult, it took him a long time to work out the ways the external world could impact his mental health in both positive and in negative ways. In his book, he collected his observations, taking a look at how the various social, commercial, technological advancements have created the world we now live in and that can actually block our happiness. Haig examines everything from inequality, social media, and the news, to things closer to our daily lives, like how we sleep, how we exercise, even the distinction we draw between our minds and our bodies. He argues that any fulfillment benchmark is about the future happiness. So fulfillment is about reaching a goal. And once you reach that benchmark, what do you do? You create a new benchmark. And then when you fulfill that benchmark, what do you do? You create a new benchmark. So it's all about trying to reach that benchmark that's just out of our reach, and that fulfillment is in the future. And if that's the case, how will we ever feel fulfillment in our present? In our search for healthy living, we might use the term uh, Zenzucht. It's German. It's translated as longing, desire, yearning, craving. And some psychologists use this word to represent thoughts and feelings about all parts of our life that are unfinished or imperfect while we are yearning for the ideal. Is hope ever in the present or is it always in the future? And if hope is all about the future, does it mean we will never reach that sense of fulfillment? What do we need for the present, for the today? The now. How can we yearn for the future and live deeply and authentically in the present? So do you remember that photo that was up there of the child that was being thrown up in the air? Okay. So it reminded me of when I was little. And the thing that I loved the most was my dad would lie on the ground and stick his feet up in the air and I would put my belly on his legs that were in the air, and he'd hold my hands, and we would play airplane. I would be an airplane. And then at a certain point, he would let go of my arms, and I would feel like I was flying. Now, I didn't hope that my father wouldn't let me fall, but I trusted that he wouldn't let me fall. You you hear that distinction? And I would say, 
again, again, Daddy, again, again, to get that sense of excitement in the knowledge that I was actually safe. We are called to wake up in the present, to the gifts of the present, to the wonder of the present, to live in gratitude. The letter to the Romans reminds people to wake up from slumber. And for most of us living in a capitalist society, it's a society seeking perfection. And of course we're not perfect. So we are told that we are not good enough, that we are not enough, and that if we're lucky, we can get the latest toys, the latest gadgets, and we might for a second feel like we have enough and maybe think we are enough. And we are told that if we only had the best, the latest, the newest improved something, whether it is wrinkle cream or clothing or toys, if we don't have those, we will not be fulfilled. But that line of fulfillment, that benchmark, keeps moving forward. And when we get to the latest thing, we find that there is the next latest thing still ahead, joy and happiness, just a purchase away, especially at this time of the year. Got to find that perfect gift for someone, otherwise they're not going to love me, clearly. It's a wrinkle remover away. It's a something away. And never now. So maybe we do need to focus not so much on hope, but on trust. Trust based on our past experiences, that God, the stories of God with us in the scriptures, our own stories of being loved at some point in our lives. If we have been lucky enough to have, been, have, have had love in our past, maybe we can have trust that there will be love again. We trust in the future that God will be with us, that today, where we are, God is with us, and that we are loved in our imperfection. The followers of Jesus' way, along with the Jewish people, they had been, in this scriptural context, kicked out of Rome. And now, they were back. But... Home was different from what it used to be, and the people were different from what they used to be, and it was hard for them to figure out who they were going to be in this new present. And the present is where we live. It is today. Today. This day. Today we catch glimpses of the transcendent in beauty, Today we long for the presence of Jesus. Today we are called in gratitude to give thanks. All of us live with some kind of a set of values. These values guide our lives. Some of the values we have were received from families who raised us. Some are from our friends. Some are from society as a whole. So if you were going to name your top five values, what would they be? So think about it this way. If you were going to look forward to your tombstone, what would you want your tombstone to say about you? So I'm going to name some values, and I want you to think about which ones of them resonate with you. And keep them in mind during the whole of Advent. I'm going to come back to it over and over again about our values. So some examples might be caring, abundance, dignity, adventure, success, power, family, Friends, faith, spirituality, health, freedom, integrity, authenticity, achievement, financial security, fun, respect, love, selflessness, calmness, 
competence, artistry, control, sensitivity. Which of these values guide the decision-making in your life? And if you can name two or three, that's great. It's just that sometimes we think we're following our values, but in fact, our values have been hijacked. I'm going to share with you the concept of near enemies. So for every value we hold dear, that grounds us, that makes us who we are, there is a far enemy, an opposite. Those are obvious. So for example, hatred is a far enemy of love. But the near enemies, near enemies are sneakier and harder to spot because they look so much like our defining values. So if love is a value, and we know hate is not love, Sometimes, sometimes, needy, possessive codependency can look a lot like love when it really corrodes it. Near enemies are feelings that mimic healthy and positive ones. So, for example, perseverance is a virtue. A near enemy might be phrases like push through no matter what or tough it out while ignoring the impact of doing just that on our bodies, our minds, and our workplaces. So we have two near enemies to trust and hope. One is optimism, and one is nostalgia. Seeing the best in others, positive perspective is important. But if optimism casts all our hope into the future, it diminishes our hope in the present. And it may not actually be true. If we put all our hope in another day, another person, we drain our present from hope. Nostalgia, be it the love of family traditions or fond memories, casts all joy in the past. Longing for days when congregations were full to bursting, they can paralyze us and drain the present of the joy that God is offering for us today. Trust does not wait for the perfect conditions to happen in order for us to feel gratitude. Trust is with us both in our struggles and in our longings as human beings. Trust can even abide with us in our failures, our true failures. Those are the times when you know those core values Sometimes, for circumstances either beyond our control or even within our control, we go against those core values, the things that make us who we are, and we know when we've done it, because we can feel it in our bones. Or the times when we are misled by those near enemies, those feelings of shame and hopelessness that come in when we're surrounded by the myth of perfection, how can we hope and trust in the midst of our failures? 5,186 failures. Apparently, that's how many failed prototypes James Dyson created before he created the first bagless vacuum that quote-unquote doesn't lose suction. 5,186 failures. Failure is an integral part of our living. We will always be failing at something. And yet God is in our failures, with us in our failures. And if we never fail, we are not living 
And God is our protective armor when we inevitably fail. We're not called to be perfect people. Instead, trust is about putting on that armor of light, of love, the armor of Jesus, the love of unconditional acceptance of who we are, of mercy and grace beyond understanding. Simply failing is not a moral failure. It's not a moral flaw. It is part of the journey. Even when we look at people who we think are perfect, we know that they aren't. Maybe we don't know that for sure, but we suspect maybe they aren't. And instead of putting on an armor of light that reveals we put on a false armor, a near enemy, the idol of flawlessness. Some of you will remember that on October 8, 1956, in Game 5 of the 1956 World Series, a pitcher named Don Larson of the New York Yankees threw a perfect game against the Brooklyn Dodgers at Yankee Stadium. It was the only no-hitter in World Series history until the Houston Astros pitching staff threw a combined no-hitter this past November the 2nd in Game 4 of the series against the Philadelphia Phillies. Larson's game, though, remains the only perfect game in the history of the World Series in 1956. He threw a perfect game, but it does not mean he had a perfect life. While Don Larson was pitching his perfect game, his wife was filing for divorce the same day. Perfectionism breeds disappointment, contempt, fragility, hopelessness. Brené Brown talks about other near enemies. So she talks about recovery. So her definition is the belief that the grief we carry will end and that we will go back to who we used to be versus resilience, where we assume that we will carry grief with us because it's part of our story, but it doesn't have to control us. If we are struggling to be who we used to be, we are str struggling for a long ago image of perfection that we're not going to find. And we are spending our time hiding who we actually are in this moment. Afraid to be honest about our wounds, our fractures, our grief. We're afraid to be honest about those. And if we are, we will spend all our time and our energy trying not to be human. In fear of being discovered as human. In dealing more graciously with ourselves, we deal more graciously with others. Even when those struggles are hidden behind dismissive, hurtful behavior, gratitude does not deny struggle, but recognizes that there can be joy even in the midst of struggle, that frailty and beauty are not opposites, and that they can coexist, and that where there is trust, Hope also lives. Putting on the armor of light does not mean we will, we will not get hurt. But it means that in the midst of the hurt, we will find healing, strength, a bomb. We are not alone. 
We are united with our source of strength, with God, which is a far deeper connection than we can think, imagine, or articulate. We are connected to this ground of being by simply being alive, by wearing that armor of God, by being held and caught in the tender arms of Jesus, by trust and by hope. So as we're journeying, whether we're an airplane in the sky, whether we're a child being thrown up in the air, no, you are loved and trust. Thanks be to God. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylin Olmsted and I'm a member of this church. I'm here to give another sustainability minute. So for this minute today, on the advent of Christmas shopping season, I thought I would go over the idea of greenwashing and kind of give a definition of what it is and what to look for. So another reason why I wanted to cover greenwashing is because while there are lots of companies who are really trying to take environmental and ethical responsibility, there are also lots of companies who are not and are just trying to pass off like as if they are. So what exactly is greenwashing? Well, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, greenwashing is the attempt to make people believe that a company is doing more to protect the environment than it really is. So to Uh, figure out what greenwashing is or how to look for greenwashing, I put up on the slide three questions to ask yourself. And these questions came from a 2000 study by TerraChoice. Now that study did give us about seven indicators, but since I have limited time today, I just decided to focus on three main ones. So the first question to ask yourself is, is there a legitimate third party certification attached to this product? Now what I mean by that is, let's say for instance, you're trying to buy a new appliance and you're trying to find one that's energy efficient. If the appliance claims that it's energy efficient, but there's no third party certification attached to it, like Energy Star, then you don't really have a way to tell whether it is actually energy efficient. So it might be a case of greenwashing. So third party certification is a really great way to decide whether or not the company is being legitimate in their claim. A second question to ask yourself is, is the company making vague claims that could be easily misunderstood? For example, a lot of companies claim that their products are all natural but there are lots of minerals and chemicals that can be found in nature but are poisonous to humans. For instance, mercury. So when a company makes the claim that they're all natural, it's very vague if they do not clarify what they mean when they say that it's an all natural product. The third question to ask yourself is, is the company being transparent? And what I mean by this is, if you do a bit of research into their company, can you find documents where they can prove where their materials came from? Do they have documents stating what their environmental impact is? There's more and more regulations coming out requiring companies to publish these things, and the more, and the more that a company publishes those, those data and facts, the more transparent they're being. So if you do happen to find greenwashing, try to avoid the product if you can, and do some research to support companies who are employing environmentally friendly practices. However, if you can't avoid the product, try calling the company and asking them questions about their environmental impact. The more calls they get from consumers being concerned about their environmental impact, the more likely they are to actually address the problem. So in future minutes, I hope to address how to cover, um, if, how to determine if a company is actually being environmentally friendly and kind of go over more of those third party certifications. But in the meantime, I hope this minute can help you live a more sustainable and environmentally friendly lifestyle. Thank you. Our offering is a symbol of the ministry that we offer. In gratitude for the gifts of life, we give as we are able. We give to support this community and this building. We give because we believe that God calls us to make a difference in the world. We give as a sign that we want the world to be one of loving kindness and justice, uh, justice seeking, where welcome lives, where we cultivate gratitude and wonder, Thanks be to God for all that you have already given. And please note that there is a box at the end, uh, at the back of the sanctuary for your offerings.
at Grosvenor Park United Church, the prayers of the people are done by the people, all of you. For confidentiality concerns, these mm -hmm. prayers are removed from the recording. Prayers can be shared at the GPUC Family Facebook page, which requires permission to join, or are listed in the leaflet, GPUC's electronic communication. There are microphones on either side that you can share your prayers. I'm just gonna put on my affirming hat for a moment. Um, long before COVID, I'm not sure how many uh, community dinners we did. And as time progressed, we got to see more and more faces that we hadn't seen before. And I cannot tell you how thrilled that made us as a committee because there, we know there are people out there with nowhere to go on holidays who have no support, who have no family, or perhaps they're students and just can't go home at Christmas. And so we started these community dinners and then COVID happened, which I think hit all of us, of course, but our committee is a committee of doers. And all of a sudden there was nothing we could do. And so at Thanksgiving, we started again with, well, let's try this. And we can't do this without you. Like you support our committee so much. You help us live our vision and we appreciate that so much. So Christmas day, Christmas dinner. Thank you.
And now we'll share, say together the prayer that Jesus taught us all. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For the blessing, just a reminder, uh, if you didn't pick up a, an advent calendar and you may have gotten one that doesn't have the colors, it is all of, also available on a link in the leaflet um, and as a picture on our Facebook page. Also, you will have received two postcards that are called December Caring, and they are, one is for you and one is to give away to someone else. And they have some significant dates that we want to share for December. So please take them and uh, share one as you will. The Holy One waits in the world for us to join in this shared journey of mystery, in hope, peace, joy, and love. Let us go in deep, intimate waiting, and with Creator's blessing. May the hope of God's gifts be deep with us. May the peace and joy of Jesus lead us to justice. May all surrounding love of the Spirit draw us close and release us to love the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. 